So every week now, there are new papers coming out about Zika virus. I'm amazed at how many virologists have switched to Zika virus, and I must say we are no exception. We've got the, a number of strains of the virus in our laboratory, and we're asking questions like, what kind of cells in the brain does the virus infect? What does it do to them? And perhaps more importantly, how does the virus get across the placenta and get into the developing fetus? What does it do there to cause birth defects? For 50 years, there were less than 20 human cases identified in Africa and in Asia. For reasons we don't understand, the virus started spreading in 2003 throughout the Pacific, and it made its way to Brazil in the beginning of 2015. And it got the world's attention when it infected large numbers of people in the northeastern part of Brazil, and that was associated with a dramatic rise in a birth defect known as microcephaly. Now, an association doesn't mean causation, so it took a while for the right studies to be done. But just in the past few months, there have been a number of small studies, uh, mostly out of Brazil, which have shown that Zika virus apparently uh, can enter the developing fetus and cause a variety of birth defects. One of the most prominent, of course, is microcephaly, uh, where the skull and the brain are smaller than they should be. And we think that the virus can get into neural tissue and replicate there and cause problems. Well, I think one of the interesting aspects is that the viruses that have been sequenced so far fall into African and Asian lineages, and it's the Asian lineage that is circulating in Brazil. And the question is, of course, is that lineage particularly better at infecting people and spreading than the others? Very hard question to answer, but interesting problem. As you mentioned, the structure of the virus has been solved, so now we can make gorgeous pictures of this virus, a deadly virus, but beautiful, and we can see exactly what it looks like. Uh, I think some of the interesting and important discoveries include one by several groups which have shown that certain mice can be used as models for infection. So wild-type mice, laboratory mice, uh, aren't terribly infectable with the virus, but if you remove parts of their immune system, uh, you can then infect them. The virus will enter the central nervous system and replicate there. And Interestingly, one of the other sites of replication are the testes. So that has implications for sexual transmission of the virus as well. So having a mouse model will inform us about basic science, but it can also be used to screen for antivirals and vaccines in the future. We need an, an, an animal model uh, in order to do that. And I think the other important finding is that, at least in culture, Zika virus is able to infect cells of neuronal origin which confirms some of the signs that we're seeing both in fetuses and in adults. Now, we do have territories of the U.S. like Puerto Rico, uh, the American, American Virgin Islands, Samoa, and they have already had circulation of Zika virus in mosquitoes on those islands and transmission to people. As I said earlier, here in the U.S., the continental U.S., we've only had imported cases. So the question is, will Zika virus spread within the U.S.? Now, the mosquitoes, that spread the virus are here, Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus. They tend to be mainly in the southern states, but the range extends up uh, to New Jersey and parts of New York and a little bit westward. And the question is whether they're gonna be transmitting the virus. Now here, my opinion is based on the following. We have had dengue virus, which is extensive in Brazil, as much as Zika virus, perhaps more. We've had chikungunya virus brought into the country on multiple occasions, and there only have been very, very small outbreaks of dengue virus in Texas uh, and in Florida. Those, vi those viruses are transmitted by the same mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus. Now, our lifestyle is somewhat different here. We have screens on most of our windows. We have air conditioning, so we can stay inside a lot. And in many places, there's great population density, but I think the opportunities for interacting with mosquitoes are fewer. And there's one more important fact that informs my prediction, which I'll tell you in a moment. Dengue virus, chikungunya virus, Zika virus are spread from person to person. There are no animal reservoirs in the U.S. West Nile virus, which was very good at spreading through the U.S., is also present in birds, and other animals, so a big reservoir builds up of the virus from which mosquitoes can take and infect humans. So for all these reasons, 
Uh, and, and furthermore, Z uh, West Nile virus is spread by a different mosquito, culicine mosquitoes, which are far more prevalent up here, especially than Aedes species. So for all these reasons, I think we're not going to have extensive spread uh, of Zika virus in the U.S. So one of the uh, issues with Zika is that much of the Western Hemisphere was susceptible. None of us had been infected before. We didn't have antibodies to prevent infection, a second infection. And that's why at the moment it's spreading like crazy through South America, Central America. But lots of people are susceptible and the mosquitoes are everywhere. I have a feeling that after a few years um, so many people will be infected that the rate of transmission will go down and if we don't have a vaccine we'll likely have cyclical outbreaks maybe every five or eight years or so. Now for most people uh, the, the risks of serious disease are really minimal. Uh, in most people, first of all, only one in five people who are infected seem to get any kind of disease. You know, the typical Zika disease is a rash, a fever, a little conjunctivitis, uh, joint pain, headaches, and so forth, and, and very rare fatalities. So not a serious disease. Uh, the problem, of course, is if you are pregnant, you don't want to be infected because there are apparently uh, threats to the fetus. Now, having babies born with congenital birth defects is a tragedy. There's no doubt about that. And we don't want to have them born that way because uh, they have to be cared for their entire lives. But I want to remind everyone that other viruses that we have now in our population are able to cause birth defects as well. Cytomegalovirus, which infects nearly everyone on the planet, is a serious cause of birth defects globally. We don't have any way to prevent that. Rubella virus used to be a huge cause of birth defects in the U.S. Before a vaccine was introduced in 1969, there were outbreaks of rubella every five to eight years, and they were accompanied by children being born with birth defects at a rate of about one in a thousand live births. Now, we have a vaccine for rubella. We can prevent congenital rubella syndrome. It's been eliminated from the U.S., but listen to this. In the rest of the world, there are up to 100,000 babies born every year with birth defects caused by rubella, which is a vaccine-preventable disease. It's part of the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And why is this? Because we simply don't immunize everyone uh, who should. So put into context, I don't think Zika is a huge threat to the world's population. We can take measures to minimize our exposure and minimize the dangers to the prime uh, candidates who are the fetuses. So most virus infections, in fact, Every infection often does not result in symptoms. There are a few exceptions. One of them is rabies. When you get rabies infection, most people infected have symptoms of rabies. Uh, Ebola is probably the same. We're not actually quite sure, but most people who get infected with Ebola have symptoms. But most other viruses, it's a fraction of people who have symptoms. The virus I've worked my whole career on, polio virus, only one in 100 people get paralysis. Uh, the others may have no symptoms at all or a mild flu-like illness. So Zika, about one in five infected people uh, seem to display symptoms which include the rash and the fever and so forth. So this is a, a worry, right? Because you could be infected and you wouldn't know it. And again, if you're pregnant or thinking of getting pregnant, you wouldn't even go for health care advice on that because you wouldn't know you were infected. So I would say if you're in an area uh, that w where Zika is circulating and, and you're early in your pregnancy or you're thinking of getting pregnant, you should go have a blood test to see if you've got Zika infection. Uh, and and right, at, right now we can do some tests to figure out if you've been infected, but the real scary part to me is that you could be infected with no symptoms and not know it. And being pregnant and having uh, that state is, is really dangerous, I think. I think mosquito control is our only option because vaccines and antivirals will take a few years to develop. We were lucky with Ebola in that we'd had a number of vaccines developed and we're at the point of being tested in humans. And during the outbreak in West Africa, uh, they were immediately put into testing. We don't have any candidate vaccines for Zika. I'm sure in, people are working them on them at the moment. I'm sure people are working on antivirals and monoclonal antibody therapy like ZMAP for Ebola virus. Short term though, mosquito control is the most important uh, way we can prevent infection. If you bring down levels of mosquitoes, you don't have to eliminate them all. Bring them down to a certain level, you'll cut uh, infection. If you inform people to try and be sensible and, and avoid being bitten by mosquitoes, you can do that. 
you know, eliminate standing water if you're living in, in an area with that and so forth. I think that's our best short-term uh, solution to this. Thank you.